in this part we are going to review the most fundamental interactions that control the relative orientation between the spin and the orbital momenta and give rise to the overall magnetism in matter. So namely, we're going to look at the Heisenberg interaction, the spin orbit coupling, and the Zeeman effect. We leave the crystal field discussion to the next lecture. Let's start. Heisenberg exchange describes the interaction between two spins. To understand where it comes from, we consider the heliomatum, a system of two electrons orbiting around the nucleus, and studied by Heisenberg in 1926. The first two terms of the Hamiltonian describe the kinetic energy of each electron. The next two terms describe the Coulomb interaction between each electron and the nucleus. The last term accounts for the Coulomb repulsion between these two electrons. As explained in the previous lecture, if I want to describe the total wave function of the two electron system, I need to consider the eigenstate of the total angular momentum of this system. There are different ways I can do that. I can, for instance, compute this wave function using klebsch gordon coefficients, or I can also observe that the total wave function must be antisymmetric upon exchange between the two electrons simply because those electrons are fermions. So, if I consider the ground state of helium, I must have two electrons on the same orbital, 1s. The wave function of my two electron system is composed of two parts, an orbital contribution and a spin contribution. Because both electrons occupy the same orbital, the orbital contribution must be symmetric upon exchanging the two electrons. This means that the spin contribution must be antisymmetric. So I end up with the singlet state, up and down. Let's now look at the excited state. Such a state is composed of one electron in the ground state, 1s, and one electron in either 2s or 2p states. Now I have two possibilities. Either the excited spin is anti-parallel to the spin of the ground state, forming a singlet state with symmetric orbital contribution, or it is anti-parallel to the spin of the ground state, and it forms a triplet state with anti-symmetric orbital contributions. The question now is whether the energy of this excited state changes when it is in the singlet or triplet configuration. To answer the question, we need to compute the total energy for both excited states. If you take only into account the non-interacting part of the Hamiltonian, the first four terms, there is no difference in the energy of the singlet and triplet state. Actually, all the interesting physics come from the interacting part, the electron-electron repulsion. This energy is different from the single state and for the triplet state. You can write these two energies as a sum of a direct contribution, noted I, and an exchange contribution, noted J. The actual spectrum is actually reported here. And what we see is that the triplet state has a lower energy compared to the singlet state. It means that if the exchange J is positive, the two electron spin align parallel to each other. If it is negative, the two electron spins will align anti-parallel to each other. This is the essence of the Heisenberg exchange. The power of the Heisenberg model became compelling with the modeling of electron exchange in dihydrogen molecule proposed by Heitler and London in 1927. In this model, two electrons orbit around two nuclei. This Hamiltonian contains eight terms. Electron one orbiting around 
the isolated atom one, electron two orbiting around the isolated atom two, and four terms accounting for the interaction between electrons and nuclei. To solve this problem, I can reorganize my Hamiltonian and parse it in several components. These terms describe the single electron orbiting around the two nuclei. These ones describe the second electron orbiting around the two nuclei, and the last part here accounts for the interaction between the two nuclei. Well, this one can actually be neglected. In this model, we can treat the interaction between the two electrons as a perturbation. Now, let us look at the solution of one electron orbiting around two nuclei, which corresponds to the red and blue boxes. This is a standard problem of quantum mechanics, and we end up with a bonding state whose wave function is the sum of the individual atomic orbitals of each atom, and O here is the overlap integral between the two atomic orbitals. At higher energy, I also have an anti-bonding state, whose wave function is the difference between the individual atomic orbitals. The energy difference between these two states is called delta here. So bottom line, if I neglect the electron-electron interaction, my spectrum has two states. The bonding state with wave function psi b and the anti-bonding state with wave function psi a. Now, let's turn on the electron-electron interaction. There again, I can follow the same symmetry arguments as for the helium atom. If I look at the excited states, I end up with two possibilities. One singlet state whose orbital part is symmetric, and what triplet state whose orbital part is anti-symmetric. As a reminder, the spin part of the singlet and triplet states are reported on the right. If I replace the wave functions of the bonding and anti-bonding states with the atomic orbitals, I obtain these new formulas. It turns out that the second term of the singlet wave function is unphysical at large distances. So we can discard it. This inconsistency comes from our assumption that the electron-electron interaction can be treated as a perturbation of the bonding and anti-bonding states. If I compute the matrix elements of the electron-electron interaction for the singlet and triplet states, I end up with an exchange interaction that depends on three quantities. The overlap between the atomic orbitals, O, the Coulomb integral, C, and the exchange integral, X. You immediately see that the sign of the exchange depends on these coefficients and can be either positive or negative depending on the overlap integral. In the case of dihydrogen atom, the exchange is negative, which means that the spins of the two electrons are anti-parallel to each other. If the overlap integral vanishes, say the nuclei are, are far away from each other, the exchange integral is positive, like in helium, and the spins are parallel. None of the two models we have seen include any explicit spin interaction. They only involve electron-electron interaction. Because of the fermionic nature of the electron, the composite wave function must be antisymmetric under permutation, which imposes a constraint on the relative orientation between the two spins. So fundamentally, the electron-electron interaction acts on the parity of the wave function, not on the spin. But the fermionic nature of the electrons connect this parity with the spin direction, resulting in the famous Heisenberg exchange interaction. In conclusion, the Heisenberg interaction must be maximized or minimized when the spins are collinear to each other. So a natural extension is to write this interaction as an energy constant times 
the scalar product between two spin vectors. The Heisenberg interaction is the exchange integral. And as we said, a positive exchange leads to a ferromagnetic configuration, while a negative exchange leads to an anti-ferromagnetic configuration. Let us now move to the spin-orbit interaction. One way to understand this interaction is to consider an electron moving in the electric field or in a potential gradient. In its rest frame, this electron experiences a magnetic field of the form 1 over 2 c squared m cross gradient of v. c is the velocity of light, v is the velocity of the electron, and gradient of v is the gradient of the potential. Since the electron carries a magnetic moment, this magnetic moment couples to the magnetic field, which results in a coupling between the electron spin and momentum mediated by the potential gradient. This is called the spin-orbit coupling interaction and has a wide range of beautiful effects in Kerner's matter, as we will see all throughout this course. Close to the nucleus, the potential is mostly central. So we can rewrite this interaction this way, where we directly recognize the orbital moment operator L. And we end up with a form S dot L that we call the Russell Sunder coupling form. What is the role of this interaction in a real system? Since the potential gradient of a crystal is normally dominated by the central potential of the atom that compose the crystal, let us consider an isolated atom. What we know very well is how to compute the spectrum of a hydrogenoid atom with a central potential. The typical Hamiltonian is of the form given above, with a kinetic term and a central potential V. In this approximation, the orbital moment is well defined, as we have seen in details in the previous lecture. Actually, the real Hamiltonian looks rather like that, where electron-electron interaction and spin-orbit interactions are also present. It is convenient to rewrite the real Hamiltonian as a sum of three contributions, a central field part, a residual part, and a spin-orbit part. The residual Hamiltonian regroups all the terms that are neither the central potential nor the spin-orbit coupling. The spin-orbit coupling is written in the Russell sanders form given previously as dot L. To solve this Hamiltonian, we need to make some approximations. First of all, it is clear that the central field Hamiltonian dominates over the residual and spin-orbit coupling contributions. But then, how do we choose the next step of approximation? This leads us to consider two canonical approximations. If the residual part dominates over the spin-orbit coupling, then the electron-electron interaction is very strong, and the electrons can be considered as a whole, defined by their total orbital momentum and their total spin momentum. Then the spin-orbit coupling couples those two quantities. This is called the russell sanders coupling scheme. Now on the opposite part, if the atom is very heavy, then the spin-orbit coupling dominates over the residual part, and every single electron is defined by its total angular momentum. This is called the JJ coupling scheme. We have seen that the relative orientation between the spin of the different electrons composing the atom depends on the competition between intraatomic exchange and spin orbit coupling. Now, how do these interactions collaborate to determine the ground state of a given atom? Let's take a couple of examples. First, consider the carbon atom, with two valence electrons in its p-shell. There are several manners to distribute these two electrons on the three p orbitals. Let's put one spin up and one orbital. 
then I can put the second spin on the same orbital, but then it needs to be anti-parallel due to Pauli's exclusion principle. Now, I can put it on any other orbital too. So in this case, if I count, I end up with 15 possibilities. It's even more striking if I consider the cobalt ion. There, I need to distribute seven spins on five d orbitals. And if I count it right, I end up with 120 possibilities. So how to determine the correct ground state? The answer to this question was given by Friedrich Huhn for light's elements, namely elements obeying Russell Saunders' spin orbit coupling scheme. Huhn stated three rules. First, the spin-spin interaction dominates, which means that the lowest energy state is the one with the largest spin s. This is a direct consequence of Pauli exclusion principle. The electrons are more likely to spread on the various orbits to minimize spin-spin interaction. Once the spin-spin interaction has been minimized, then come the orbit-orbit -orbit interaction. The electron must minimize the interaction between orbits of same direction. It means that the orbital number L must be maximized. Finally, the spin orbit coupling must be satisfied too, which means that the S and L must be parallel. Namely, in a shell that is less than half filled, the total angular momentum J is the equal to the absolute value of L minus L. When it is more than half filled, it should be L plus S. And when it is exactly half filled, the orbital moment vanishes and the total angular momentum is simply equals to S. Let me emphasize that this set of rules applies consistently and atoms that are light enough so that Russell Saunders' spin orbit coupling scheme applies. We can train ourselves on some concrete examples. In the case of carbon atom, we have two electrons to distribute on three p orbitals. To fulfill the first Huhn's rule, I first fill the orbital L equal 1 with spin up and then the orbital L equal 0 also with spin up. The total spin moment is one half plus one half, so s equal one. And the total orbital moment is also l equals one. Since the shell is less than half filled, the total angular momentum j is zero. Now in the case of cobalt two plus, we have seven electrons to distribute on five d orbitals. I will first fill all the orbitals with electrons with spin up. Then the two remaining electrons must have a spin down and occupy the two orbitals with the highest orbital moment. The total spin moment is then 3 half and the total orbital moment is 3. Since the shell is more than half filled, the total angular momentum J is 9 half. In the case of neodymium 3 plus, we have three electrons to distribute on 7f orbitals. Then I simply fill the first three orbitals with spin up. The total spin moment is 3 half, the total orbital moment is now pretty large and equal to 6. Since the shell is less than half filled, the total angular momentum j is 9 half. Finally, in the case of dysprosium 3 plus, we have nine electrons to distribute on seven f orbitals. Then seven electrons are distributed evenly over the f orbitals and have all spin up. The remaining two electrons have spin down and occupy the two orbitals with the largest orbital moment. The total spin moment is five half and the total orbital moment is five. Since the shell is more than half filled, the total angular momentum J is 15 half. To see concretely how Hood's rule works, let us have a closer look 
to the case of carbon. Its valence is 2p2, so we simply need to distribute two electrons on three p levels. So in this example, I take the convention that the level on the left has a magnetic quantum number of minus one, the level in the center has a magnetic quantum number of zero, and the one on the right has a magnetic number of plus one. Fine. To distribute my two electrons, let us first maximize my total orbital angular momentum. To do so, I need to put both electrons either on the left or on the right orbital. In this case, the two spins must be anti-parallel so that the total spin momentum is zero. Next, I distribute my two electrons in order to have a total orbital momentum of minus one. To do so, I need to put one electron on the left orbital and one electron on the central orbital. These two electrons can be either both up or down or antiparallel. Of course, I have the same configuration for a total orbital momentum of plus one. Now I am left with a case where the total orbital momentum is zero. I can put either the two electrons on the outer orbital. This way I'm going to have a plus one and a minus one quantum number and they compensate. In this case, again, I can have both spin up or both spin down, or again, spin antiparallel. The last possibility is to put both electrons in the central orbital, and in this case, they must be antiparallel. So this way, I have described my 15 configurations and ordered them with respect to their total orbital and total spin momentum. This table summarizes the number of configurations with respect to their total orbital and total spin projection. Remember that what we want is to obtain the ground state and the first excited states of carbon. These states are expressed using the term symbol, which is a way to represent a quantum state in terms of total spin, total orbital, and total angular momenta. If I look at the table I draw in the previous slide, I realized that among the 15 spin configurations, one state possesses a total spin momentum of zero and has a total magnetic quantum number that spans from minus two to plus two. In other words, these configurations are the ones of a quantum state with L equal two and S equal zero. This is a state 1D2 where d corresponds to an orbital momentum of l equal 2, and the subscript 2 corresponds to the total angular momentum j equal 2. I also have a state with a total number spanning from minus 1 to plus 1, and a total magnetic quantum number spanning from minus 1 to plus 1. This corresponds to a total spin momentum of 1 and a total orbital momentum of 1. The total angular momentum j can then adopt three values, 0, 1, and 2. So according to the term symbol, we then obtain three states, 3p0, 3p1, and 3p2. Finally, we are left with one configuration that ensures both l equals 0 and s equals 0. This corresponds to the state 1s0. As we discussed above, because carbon atom is light, the spin-orbit coupling is weak, and Russell Sanders' scheme applies, which means that the total orbital momentum L and the total spin momentum S are well defined, and we can use Hund's rules to determine the energy ordering of the states. Remember that following Hund's rules, a large spin is more important than a large orbital momentum. So in the present example, the ground state is given by the triplet 3p0, 3p1, 3p2, because it gives the maximum spin momentum with large enough orbital momentum. The next energy state is given by 1d2 because it gives a vanishing spin but a large orbital momentum. And finally, the last state is 1s0. Now if I consider a heavy atom, say, lead, 
then the Russell Sanders coupling is not appropriate anymore because spin-obby coupling is too large. I have to adopt the JJ coupling scheme. There, I first need to list the total angular momentum of each electron. Since they lie on p orbital and possess a spin of one half, I have two values for each total angular momentum, one half and three half. Combining the two electrons, I end up with states that are different compared to Russell Sanders scheme. In this scheme, in the JJ scheme, the ground state is the one with the smallest total angular momentum. So it will be J one half, one half. The next step will be one half, three half, and the last one, three half, three half. The illustration of the difference between Russell Saunders and JJ coupling schemes is given in this graph. Starting from carbon and silicon, the spinobic coupling is weak and Russell Saunders coupling reproduces the atomic levels pretty well. But increasing the size of the atom all the way to lead it appears that the JJ coupling is more appropriate. In most materials, we are going to consider, in particular the 3D, 4D, and 5D series, the Russell Saunders coupling is reasonable. However, when one wants to go for much heavier ma materials like lead or uranium compounds, then we need to be very careful about the way spin orbit coupling is taken care of. The last interaction we will consider in this lecture is the Zeeman effect. As mentioned earlier, both the spin and orbital momenta contribute to the magnetic moment. Therefore, when we apply a magnetic field on an electron, the behavior of this electron depends on both its spin and orbital momenta. This effect was discovered by Zeeman in 1896, who reported the splitting of the excitation spectrum of sodium under a magnetic field. The ground state of sodium is 3s and its first excited state is 3p. Because the p states have an orbital momentum of 1 and a spin momentum of 1 half, their total angular momentum splits into two states, 1 half and 3 half. So when measuring the excitation spectrum, one expects emission from two transitions, from state P3 half to state S, and from state P1 half to state S. And that's what you can observe on the picture. Interestingly, when one applies the magnetic field, you can notice that these two lines split differently. The left one splits into six new lines, while the right one splits into four new lines. Let's see why this is so. If the magnetic field is smaller than the spin orbit coupling, it does not couple independently to the spin and orbital momenta, but it rather couples to the total angular momentum J. The number of lines you obtain depends on the magnitude of the total angular momentum J, and the splitting itself is proportional to the coefficient GJ, which is called the Lande factor. On the other hand, if the magnetic field is very large, much larger than the spin orbit coupling, it couples independently to the spin and to the orbital momenta. This results in the passion back effect. As explained previously, the ground state of sodium has, is an S orbital. So it has a spin one half and in the presence of a magnetic field, it's going to split into two levels, plus one half, minus one half. On the other hand, the excited states have p orbitals, so they exhibit two possible total angular momenta, one half and three half. Therefore, the p one half states split into two levels under the magnetic field, plus one half and minus one half, while the p three half states split into four level, plus three half, plus one half, minus one half, minus three half. Accounting for the transition rules between the various states, we end up with a sodium spectrum observed by Zeeman. We have looked at 
the fundamental interaction that govern magnetism at the atomic scale. We have seen that magnetism emerges from the interplay between the electron-electron interactions and the spin orbit coupling, giving rise to Hund's rules. In the next part of this lecture, part C, we are going to see the origin of magnetism in solid and how it features a wide variety of magnetic configurations. So let's move on.